seen uh, Without hope before our lives could even begin But now through faith we're safe in Jesus We are given the right to be called Children of God through adoption Cause I'm in a relationship So good to be in a relationship, in a relationship with Jesus. I abide in His word, and He has set me free. Welcome back. Over the past couple of weeks, we've been talking about hugs, and one of the places where people just naturally hug each other is at the bed of a dying loved one. They do that just to receive comfort from each other especially if the person who's dying has the strength, he or she will also give those hugs. And those hugs of reassurance, especially if they're a believer, those hugs of reassurance that they know they're going to heaven because they're acceptable before God through Jesus, and a hug to say, we're going to be back together in heaven. Well, in a sense, that's what Jesus gave us during his last moments on the cross. During the last moments on his cross, he gave us a hug. He, he says something that was so reassuring. Today, we're going to look at this hug from Jesus, where he reassures us that his mission was accomplished. We see this in John's account of Jesus' death. Let's look at that. It's John 19, verses 28 to 30. Later, knowing that all was now completed, and so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge on it, put the sponge on a stalk of a hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. What we want to do is see what this means both to Jesus and to us. But before we do that, I want to point out how John emphasizes the fact that Jesus' mission was accomplished. He does this in three ways, and sometimes it's not that e easy to see from the English translations. That's why I want to spend just a moment emphasizing that. The first way he emphasizes the fact that Jesus' mission was accomplished is just in the fact that he's the only one of the four gospel writers to record Jesus' statement, it is finished. Whenever we see that happening, whenever we see a gospel writer recording something that the others don't, it grabs our attention. So also here, we look at the, that phrase, it is finished. But that's not all. The second point, and also the third point, but the second point occurs right in the beginning of our text when we read, and John says, later, knowing that all was now completed. Now this is where it gets a little bit more difficult to see the connection in the English. But that word that here is translated completed is the exact same word that Jesus said when he said it is finished. In, in other words, John is emphasizing by twice using that word that it is finished, it is completed. I don't know why the English translations use two different words here to translate it, but it's the exact same word. And also now, to look at the third point, we get, again go towards the beginning of our paragraph where it says, so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Now usually when the New Testament is saying that an uh, Old Testament passage is fulfilled by an uh, action in the New Testament. It has almost a set phrase, a, a set formula. This, this is how the words are said, and they say it that way. Well, in this case, that formula is not used. In fact, the phrase used here is unique. It's the only time it's used in the Bible. And, and the point of this is that what was being fulfilled was not one specific Old Testament passage pointing to Jesus. No, the thing that was fulfilled was the entire scripture. Everything that the scripture was talking about up to this point became a climax, reached the climax here at Jesus' cross. It's like a, a movie or a book 
where suddenly the plot unfolds and you get right to the climax of the story. The whole scripture, everything that the scripture was being built up to was being fulfilled here at Jesus' death. And what is so striking about this, even though this is not the identical word that Jesus said, it is finished, it is very close to the same words that he said when it is finished, when it says the scriptures will be fulfilled. In a sense, it says the scriptures also are finished. In these ways, then, by three times using this word, finished or completed, John is emphasizing that Jesus' mission was accomplished. Now what we want to do is say, what does this mean? And what does this mean to Jesus? Well, what this meant to Jesus, first of all, that since the beginning of time, since before the creation of the world, he had been chosen to go on this mission. And now that mission was complete. No longer did he have to keep his divine majesty under wraps. He only let it show a few times when he performed miracles, but no longer did he have to keep it under wraps. And no longer did he have to live among sinful people. Now just stop for a moment and think of how difficult that had to be for Jesus. He was holy, he was sinless, and he was living for 33 years in this world that was populated by sinful people. Imagine for a moment that you were dropped into a group of child pornographers, and you had to live there. You would want to try to escape as much as possible. You know, sin, all sin is disgusting to, to God, to Jesus, but for 33 years he lived among sinful people. But no longer his mission was accomplished. Not only that, the Bible says to, to redeem us, he placed himself under his own law. Just think about that. Again, imagine trying to live under the rules and regulations we set up for a two- or three-year-old when they are told what time to go to bed, what to eat, what to wear, and so forth. Imagine trying to live under those laws even for a week. Jesus lived under his own law for his entire life, but no longer. And finally, it meant that he no longer had to suffer. Jesus suffered both at the hands of men and of his father. Last time we talked about how he was rejected and how his disciples rejected him. We could think of all that physical pain that Jesus experienced. That, that agony that he saw in the Garden of Gethsemane, that cup that he, he saw that he had to drink. We could think of that crown of thorns on his head, the crucifixion. And we can think of the fact that he had to suffer the wrath of his heavenly father over our sins. He had to be forsaken by his father. But no longer. That is all behind him. He is finished. His mission is accomplished. But not only did it mean that, this had to fill him with great joy. It maybe would be like a marathon runner who, after running 26 miles, is crossing the finish line in first place. Now, he or she, they're totally exhausted, but they're totally filled with joy because they have won. Jesus, at his death, has won. He entered death not as a vanquished, but as a victor. John, again, in a subtle way, brings this out when he says at the end of our paragraph, with that he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Jesus really entered death on his own will. And that's what all the other gospel writers say too. All the other gospel writers talk about how at his death, with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. The whole point is, it's not so much death overtook Jesus, but Jesus entered death by giving up his own spirit. He entered death as a victor. This meant a lot to Jesus. And friends, this means a lot for us. That phrase, it is finished, was a phrase that was often used in the Greek culture. It's really only one word in the Greek language. And it was a word that was 
commonly marked on bills, to mark them paid in full. In fact, we could actually translate what Jesus said, it is paid in full. And think of the joy people experience when a debt, uh, a debt that they have carried for a long time has finally been paid in full. When you have that credit card bill and that and you've been struggling to pay that for years and you get the mail and you open it up and you see the balance is zero, it's paid in full. Or maybe, you know, the mortgage on your house. A lot of people, when they finally pay their mortgage, they have a party. They have a mortgage-burning party. But our debt was not a financial one. Our debt was, in a sense, a debt of time. Because of our sins, we owed God an eternity. Eternity in prison. A eternal life sentence in the prison of hell. Imagine, therefore, a person who has been convicted of a sin, of, of a crime. He's been convicted of a crime, a crime he knows that carries a sentence of, a, of life without parole. All he has to do is be sentenced, a formal sentencing. So he goes to that sentencing. He knows what's going to happen. He's going to be sentenced to life without parole. He walks in the courtroom, and the judge instead says, you are acquitted. You are set free. There's no community service. There's no parole. There's no probation. No strings attached. Your debt has been paid in full. I'm setting you free because somebody else has agreed to serve your sentence. Think, friends, think of the joy that that person has. And that's the joy that you and I can experience. Because Jesus, on the cross, with his death hug to us, he told us, it is finished. Your bill has been paid in full. But, friends, many times, we don't show that joy. Imagine going to a friend's house. Maybe he's sitting at his desk or at the kitchen table, and he has this very worried look on his face, and in front of him are all these bills, and you understand why he's worried. Until you go closer, and you look at those bills, and you start paging through them, and seeing that each one is paid already, it says paid in full. And you sit there and say, why are you worried? That is so foolish. That is so ridiculous. But how many times aren't, isn't that the way you and I react? Our bill has been paid in full, but we still carry around this, this sense of guilt. Yes, we should feel sorry for our sins, but being guilty and having this guilt complex is not honoring to Jesus. It's really saying, Jesus, you did not pay our debt in full. Rather, the response is, this, I'm sorry for our sin, but I am so joyful that you have already paid the debt. Or, or imagine that you were the one who paid those bills in full. You walked into that man's house, your friend's house, and he's sitting there worried about those bills. But he's not just worried. He's actually making a, a little bit of a payment on each bill. You say, what are you doing? Why are you making payments on the bill? I paid it in full. That's the message we're sending Jesus every time we think we still have to do something in order to be acceptable before God, that we have to do something in order to be saved. Again, that attitude is not honoring Jesus. The way that we honor Jesus is giving him all the glory, all the credit for, being, for paying our bill. And on top of that, we honor Jesus when we are totally confident that heaven is our home. Again, think of how you think about Judgment Day. When you think about Judgment Day, do you think about it as it's going to be the best day in your life? That judgment day is something that you're looking forward to because on that day, before the whole world, you know that you are going to be publicly acquitted, that you're going to be eagerly welcomed into heaven. We can have that assurance. We can have that joy. We can have that expectation because, again, at his death, Jesus hugged us, whispered in our ear, your debt has been paid in full. It is accomplished. Friends, mission accomplished. 
It is finished. That meant a lot to Jesus. That can mean a whole lot to you. Be convinced that because Jesus has paid for all your sins, you no longer have to carry around guilt. You no longer have to try to work your way into heaven. You no longer have to be afraid of God or fear judgment day. All that is gone because Jesus came down to earth and accomplished his mission. Friends, return often to this paragraph. Return often to this paragraph. Receive this hug from our Savior and live a joy-filled life because your debt of sin has been paid in full. Until next time, may the Lord bless you richly as you live your life in the light of this fact. Yes, and a free indeed. Let it to touch.